In this week's update, proof that we must follow the price action, why this is probably a secular bull market, and how I played the crash and the recovery. My name's Gary Davis, and as always, this is general advice only. And remember to subscribe and like the video. Okay, hopefully I'll get through this without uh, too much of a coughing fit, but uh, please uh, forgive me if, uh, if that happens. So let me just uh, have an overall perspective on, um, on what is happening in the markets. Um, I guess the thing that's become so starkly obvious in the last uh, three months is that operating to what logically makes sense has worked really badly. So the, the former expectations that people have had about how markets should behave under given economic circumstances, the relationships, the seasonal patterns, all of those things I think are broadly worthless these days because of what um, central banks and governments have done. They've completely distorted the financial system and uh, therefore why would the old relationships hold? So if you're still making decisions based on that sort of factor, then you really need to rethink your approach. So the reality of what the market has done, and the market has rebounded, particularly in America, just to an extraordinary degree that just, you know, is breathless, uh, or breathtaking, um, versus the predictions of doom and gloom, uh, is really quite stark. And when the rebound started, um, you know, I, I felt that we would uh, that we would get back to uh, a pretty reasonable level of uh, of rebound, but I did expect that we would get a retest of the lows, perhaps a higher low. Uh, so I've just been amazed by the degree of um, of rebound of the market. But it's it's just another lesson, you know, another learning point for me after three decades that there is just no substitute for following the price action. And of course, just following the price action with a random uh, play it as it comes kind of approach also doesn't work. So you need a very clear game plan. And I'm sorry if I keep banging on about a clear game plan, um, but it is just so essential. And I find that so few people actually ever sit down and do it. And yet it is the absolutely critical first step. There are a few aspects that we can't control. You know, we can't control the fact that the world got put into a lockdown, which has never really happened before, uh, and that subsequently the, the markets um, uh, ignored the virus threat and then just absolutely crashed with, uh, with no secondary high. So those things we can't control. So therefore, don't worry about them because you're just burning up energy on something that is... Um, you know, is not going to assist you. But there are many things, in fact, most things in the market we can control. So focus on them. We can control our overall exposure. We can control what stocks we buy. We can control what, what price we get in at. We can control how we manage the trade, how we take profits, how we set our stop losses. There are many, many things that we can control. So place your attention and your energies on those. There is a bigger picture at play though, and I'm not bringing this up to, um, you know, to, to provide an area of concern, but we all have to recognise that there is now an inevitable escalation between China and the US. It's not going to be resolved. You know, if you go back to where this whole trade dispute started, everyone was hopeful that next quarter or the quarter after that, that uh, the China and the US would reach some sort of trade accommodation. There's a much, much bigger game at play here. It's about the transfer of who leads the world. And the US wants to keep it and China wants it. And it's it's not going to go away. It's going to run for decades. And um, it is going to influence the way that we live. It is going to influence financial markets. But it is at such a big picture level that it really doesn't warrant um, making decisions about now. Just be mindful, though, that it is something that's huge. Um, it's going to be a real game changer, and it is in the background, but it will take a long time to play out. Now, I showed this last week. I think it's really important information, so I'm just going to run it again. 
what should you be looking for? There is no substitute for focusing on the sectors that have got enduring growth for the next five years. And I, I talk about these constantly in Portfolio Analyst and in the Insiders Club. So those members know, you know very, very clearly what, what sectors I'm talking about. And then dropping down to the next level is companies with strong balance sheets and cash flows. Uh, and then thirdly, technical outperformance. The, the fact is that the strong get stronger, particularly in the US where the Americans just love new 52-week highs. They love breakouts. So, you know, we, we don't tend to be as enthusiastic as a bra- about breakouts in Australia, but certainly the Americans love it. How to go about it? We want to buy mild weakness in the strongest groups. And we're probably just coming into a period now, and I'll talk about this on the next slide or two, uh, where there is a bit of sector rotation going on that happens from time to time, where the the strong sectors see some money moving out of that sector because they've become a bit overvalued in the short term. And that money moves into some of the rebound sectors, the real laggard sectors. And we saw some of that last week with um, industrials and financials uh, rebounding. Uh, Learn to interpret price action from the source data, and I I covered this in great detail in Portfolio Analyst over the last two weeks. The concept of relative strength is a a huge indicator. It's it's a huge advantage if you learn how to use it. Understand the self-interest of the major players is what drives markets. And so if you can look at market action through the eyes of the the major players and their self-interest, so the you know, the major funds and the hedge funds, then you've given yourself a distinct advantage. And understand the real dynamics of what drives price movement. And the more you can understand that, the more that you can be, uh, that you can anticipate what the market will do next. It's not making a prediction, but it's just assigning some probabilities And if you come at it from that side, you've increased your probabilities quite significantly. If you're just doing technical analysis by using lagging indicators, then all that's doing is telling you what has been. It really doesn't help you much with what's coming. But there are a number of things that you can do that definitely have predictive powers. They're not perfect, but they certainly help. So as I said before, there is some sector rotation occurring uh, just in the last few days. That's normal. It happens all the time. Um, But the opportunities, in my view, will not be in those rebound groups because those rebounds may be fleeting. They may not last long. And they're also not high probability. That's what history shows. When stocks are trending down, yes, they have some spectacular rallies, but they don't last. They don't go all that far and they don't last all that long. And then they turn down again very sharply. So they're actually quite dangerous. The real opportunity is buying short-term weakness in the strongest groups. The st- <coughs> I beg your pardon. The groups that have been trending up and go through a period of short-term weakness. And I think we're you know, perhaps just at the start of a couple of weeks of that sort of price action. So the overall message is focus on doing high probability things. This is not a place for being a hero or having a war story that you can tell at a barbecue that you know you were the you were the guy that bought the bottom in the banks and you know there's been a wonderful rebound and uh, you know what a terrific trader you are um, you know those sort of war stories don't carry a great deal of probability with them and I believe that the odds are that a secular bull market started in 2013 so a secular bull market is is the big picture bull market or bear market and within that we then have spectacular rallies and and uh, and declines uh, and I did cover this in in 2013 and I put up some charts and I could still remember the ch- what the chart looked like and I wasn't sure that I quite believed it myself but I did make the observation that when we broke above the 2000 and 2008 highs which occurred in 2013 that this could well be the start of a very, very big picture trend. And I think the S&P at the time was at about 1560. Now, I struggled a bit with the concept, but I just had to recognize what the price action was telling me. 
And so I, I think what's happened over the last uh, seven years has only reinforced that particular view. And if that is the case, then we've still got years to run. All right, let's turn to American stocks. So for the week, the S&P was up four and a half. Uh, sorry, for the, for the month, I beg your pardon. So these are the monthly figures, which I thought were worth doing because you know, I'm sure most people have heard the term sell in May and go away. So there's this perceived seasonality that May is a weak period or starts a weak period across the, the Northern Hemisphere summer. And that if you get out of the market in May and come back in September, then you're probably in a pretty good space. The only issue is that for the last four years, May's actually been positive. So, you know, this is where the distortion of the financial system is breaking down a lot of these old seasonality patterns. So the S&P went up 4.5% in May. The NASDAQ did even better and, and really, really important for the sustaining of this uh, market is that the Russell for small caps went up 6.9% for May. So small caps were the outperformers. Late in the week, um, the, the gains were very robust, uh, particularly on Friday night. Uh, everything looked uh, tremendous on Friday night, not, not just stocks, but commodities. Uh, you know, the whole uh, financial system was on a very, very positive note on Friday. So I think a, a pullback, a bit of a mild pullback in the S&P would be healthy. And um, it's it's got to happen. We're just not going to keep going up and up in a straight line. So that that pullback will come and it'll be healthy. But what you can do is now you can decide what your actions will be in advance. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that you take any action now, but the more that you can decide in advance how you'll play if the market does A, B or C, then the better your psychology is to deal with it because you're sort of half expecting it. And so then you don't make decisions in a bit of a panic, in a bit of a state you're sort of half ready for it. So there's no substitute for, for early preparation. I think in the next week or two, this could be an excellent time to be buying into some of the strongest sectors if we can get a, a mild pullback. Um, there are just, when you look at the American market, and I spend quite a bit of time there uh, because it does lead the other financial markets around the world. There's no question about that. And there are just breakouts and powerful trends in a number of sectors of the American market. And there really is um, you know, a significant amount of profit to be made. Now, the US dollar uh, slightly lower again. So we've come back down below the 100 mark. We're just around the 98 and a half. And the 10-year yield hasn't really moved now for some time. So let's jump in and take a look at... Um, at some of the charts. Now this is a chart of the semiconductors versus the S&P. So it's it's one divided by the other. And way over here on the the right hand on the left hand side is the year 2000. So this is when we had, you know, the the huge blow off in the Nasdaq and and um, and the you know the internet craze was in full flight. And then since then as you can see, we went into a dramatic uh, slide where semiconductors, which are really a very good barometer of the health of the US market. So when semiconductors are outperforming the S&P, it's generally a, you know, a pretty good period for the US market um, because it's indicating that technology is leading. So we had this massive fall between semiconductor stocks, <coughs> which had just got completely overcooked in the lead up to 2000. And that then bottomed out between 2007, 2008, and it was just basically performing in line with the S&P through to about 2016. So 2016 onwards, you can see semiconductors have done much better than the S&P, and they've almost doubled relative to the S&P, and that is still the case. Yes, we had a bit of a blip in March. Semiconductors got beaten up. You can see this little blip here. I'll just zero in on that. So yes, we got a bit of a, a decline during the crash, but then look how the semiconductors have rebounded and uh, continue to outperform the S&P. And that's a very positive sign for the health of the whole market. So if we look at the S&P, 
Now you can see we're now working our way. We're, we've broken through the 61.8% Fibonacci level. Uh, we've got back above the 200-day moving average now. The, the shorter term indicate, uh, moving averages, the 50-day, the, the blue, and the 20-day, which is the green, uh, are now uh, pointing upwards. The price is above both of them. It's now cleared all three moving averages. So, um, you know, there's, there's no question that, um, that this is a fairly positive tone to the market. And if we look at the Russell, so it's still lagging where the S&P is, but it's catching up very, very quickly, particularly the last few weeks. So it's all pretty positive there for the US market. There's the currency has slipped out of that wedge pattern. And um, I, I think we'll just continue to trade in this range between the mid 90s and, uh, and 100. I think that's probably the most likely scenario. And because of that weakness in the US dollar, then we saw some strength in the Australian dollar, which has now just poked its head back above the 200 day moving average. But You've got to say at this point we are still in downtrend. I know we've got a short-term uptrend and it's been pretty uh, pretty robust off the um, the panic lows in in mid March. So we've gone from 58 <coughs> back to 66. Um, but I'll still back the downtrend remaining in place until proven otherwise. There are a couple of things that I omitted to talk about that I, I said I would, that I think are important. So this is an addendum to the, uh, to the video so far. So one of the things was uh, what I saw in 2013 when the S&P market uh, actually broke out. And so uh, I'm going back to the, the concept of are we in a secular uh, bull market or a secular bear market? So from my perspective, it's it's reasonably clear in my mind that uh, this period uh, th through, um, sorry, let me just go back up a little bit further. Um, yep, so this, this period here, here's the 2000 uh, peaks. Here are the 2008, uh, 2007 peaks. So what I said at the time in 2013 was that this period here from 2000 through to 2013 was effectively a secular bear market. And within that, we had a very substantial decline from 2000 to 2002. We then had a tremendous rally uh, to the peak in 2007. We then got obviously the GFC, which was a cyclical bear market within uh, a secular bear market. So this whole area here is a secular or long-term bear market and that when we broke out in the middle of 2013 we broke out above these 2000 and 2008 highs was the start of a new secular bear market a uh, bull market I should say so a long-term bull market and that what we had in 2018 was a very brief cyclical bear market and we've just had another one but it is still within the context of a, a long-term secular bull market that started in 2013 and therefore is likely to have quite a number of years yet to run. So that was the point that I, that I wanted to make. Now, the second point that I wanted to touch on was how I actually played the crash and the recovery. And there's two aspects to this. So... One way to deal with this is to do nothing and just put up with the pain. Now, 99% of people can't do that. And as the market gets to the bottom and the crescendo of bad news and the media gets louder and louder, people tend to sell out around the bottom. So that approach really works in such a dramatic slide. So during this decline, uh, I did cash up and advised members to cash up on several occasions. Now, fortunately, the stocks that we're in, most of that cashing up was taking profits or in some cases getting out at break even. We did take a, a loss on a couple of stocks, but the key point was to cash up, to get cash levels up to 30, 40, 50% so that you had the firepower when, when inevitably the market turned. 
And so this, the second part of it, which is just as important, is that you then need to be very willing and very um, quick to buy into this rebound. So if you've cashed up on the way down and then you bought into the rebound on the way up, then you should have done really quite well and, um, and portfolios um, you know, should have returned to, uh, to a higher level than before the crash occurred. So I think that um, that might help uh, some people in dealing with these sort of things in the future. To me, the two go hand in hand. One without the other is um, just doesn't work. You've got to have the cash available when we get to the bottom. And then the second part is that you've got to be very ready and willing to jump back into the market. Um, so they were the extra uh, addendum points that I wanted to make. All right, turning now to Aussie stocks, uh, the Aussie dollar, as, as I showed, moved up 66.58. Um, you know, iron ore commodity prices are certainly helping that. Now, our, our index gained 4.7% on the week. We saw a big surge in the banks, but will it continue? And this gets to the heart of one of the themes that I, I'm talking about in this, uh, this week's episode, and that is, is it wise to chase these rebound stocks in sectors that have not only been dramatically out of favour, but now actually face very, very significant headwinds for years to come. The answer I get every time I look at this is absolutely not, but there are certain, uh, certain people that still want to chase you know, the big turnaround story. Um, for me, there is no substitute for working with probabilities. You know, we, we don't have any certainties in financial markets. All we have is probability and a game plan. So you, you've got to use those to the best effect. And trying to, trying to buy and play rebounds in stocks that have got massive headwinds, to me, is just not playing the probabilities. So for me, I'll take a 20% gain in a sector that's trending up and therefore has a 90% certainty of continuing over a 40% gain that has maybe a 20% certainty of succeeding every day of the week. And if you do the maths on a risk-weighted basis, you get an 18% return versus an 8% return, and I'll take those odds any day. So, you know, that was a point that I've really been hammering in portfolio analyst and, um, you know, I hope everybody at least gives this some thought. All right, let's take a look at, um, at the ASX 200. So we've just made it back to the 50. We had a little peak over the 50% the, the level on, uh, on Thursday, but it wasn't able to hold it. Um, but it was quite a, quite a robust session in, um, in the US on Friday night. So we may actually open fairly well on, uh, on Monday. But look at the volume on Friday. There was some staggeringly big volumes on, uh, on Friday, which was really quite interesting, given that it's not options expiry. Uh, it's not the end of a quarter, so I'm a little mystified by uh, by these really high volumes. But let's look at the banks. It was the banks that did it predominantly last week? You can see we had three really big days, but then turned around again on uh, on Friday. It had reached the 38.2, so it's been significantly lagging. Um, and yeah, this just gets back to what I've been talking about. It's it's playing the probability. Yes, you can get a big percentage gain if you manage to get your timing right, but this is not a high probability exercise. Whether it's the banks or it's you know so many other stocks like AMP or Telstra or you know people, some people seem to be drawn to these opportunities like a moth to a flame. You know, it's like it's like the the department store that's got a 70% off sale. You know, people can't resist a bargain, but the financial markets are a very different animal altogether. And the probabilities lie with the strength getting stronger. I guess that's the whole point I'm trying to make. Let's have a look at precious metals. This is the weekly chart. You can see we're still clearly in this very, very powerful uptrend. We're going to have some resistance in the gold price around 1800 and then uh, just over 1900 So they're the two big key resistance levels. But going with what is, you've got to say the uptrend is still up. We're still towards the top of the channel. Uh, we could get a bit of a pullback. So gold could pull back as far as 1675 
and still be in this very, very powerful uptrending channel. So don't be put off by short-term weakness in uh, in the gold price. Um, and there you can see we've we've really been in a period of consolidation with gold since the middle of April. But the direction is still very much to the upside. So gold fell another six dollars, uh, seventeen thirty-one. But we're still looking pretty buoyant. Now looking at under the hood a bit on some of the things behind the gold price, there's been a twenty-three billion dollar inflow into gold ETFs in the first quarter of uh, of this calendar year, and that represents in tonnage terms the largest tonnage addition since two thousand and six, and that's st stats from the World Gold Council. So. There are, there are two kinds of players in the gold market. There are futures speculators that are in there for the short term. They're in there with high leverage and they come in and out of the market quite regularly. They can start a trend, but they do not have the firepower to sustain a long-term trend. The long-term trend requires serious investment. It requires money, serious money, far, far bigger money, and it requires money that's prepared to be in there for period, long periods of time. That's what sustains an uptrend in the gold market. And it's the gold ETFs, the ETFs that actually buy physical gold, that show you what the serious players are doing for the longer term. So the fact that there is such a massive inflow into the gold ETFs is, um, is another reinforcing factor. <coughs> I beg your pardon. Now, the gold miners uh, have lagged gold in 2020. They're both up 11%. Now, I say lagged because normally the gold miners would outperform the price of gold by uh, about two and a half to three times. So if the gold price has gone up 11%, then we would have expected miners to go up by between, say, 25 and and 30 or even 35%. But as a group, they have not. So miners have lagged compared to the normal relationship. And their starting point at the end of 2019 was that they were way undervalued anyway. So it's not that they're lagging because, you know, the ratio was out of whack before. It, it was, but it was out of whack to the, to the downside. So the catch up to get back to the long term historical ratios for gold stocks as opposed to gold is really quite massive. So there's still a big catch up to be played and gold stocks relative to gold are still at historic lows. We're talking multi, multi-decade lows. As far back as the data, the data I've got goes back to the middle of the 1980s. Uh, so I can tell you that the, the ratio between gold stocks and, and gold has never been lower over the last uh, nearly 40 years. Now, the next point that supports this, the performance of precious metal stocks is that um, there's plenty of examples where the free cash flow being generated by gold miners is in excess of 10%. Now, 10% free cash flow yields is, is incredibly uh, attractive when you compare it to other, uh, <laughs> other rates around the world. Earnings per share is rocketing for, for so many gold miners. Their, their costs are largely fixed, yet the gold price has been going up. And that's particularly the case for Australian uh, gold miners, where the Australian dollar gold price has done even better. Another factor is that junior gold miners are very cheap at the moment. We've seen a rebound in the larger cap stocks, but a lot of the juniors haven't started moving yet or haven't moved as much. And they're very attractive to the bigger players because the bigger players, and I'll show you a chart in a minute, are running out of, of reserves and, and resources because there's been underinvestment in exploration and there's been a lack of major discoveries because all the low-hanging fruit was found in the 70s, 80s and 90s. So there's been a, an absolute dearth of new major discoveries as the, the next slide will show you. In fact, I'll go to that now. There we go. So there is the, um, uh, there is the gold ETF flows. Oh, sorry, the, yeah, I, the, this relates to the point I was making before. 
So these are the flows going into gold ETFs. So you can see what's happened uh, just in the last um, in the last quarter. So let me go back to what I was saying with precious metals. So the juniors are very cheap. Um, the major gold discoveries have continued just to plummet since about 1990. Um, and it's, it's just a tiny fraction now of what it used to be. So faced with a lot of very expensive high-risk exploration or jumping in and buying existing resources that a junior miner might be sitting on is becomes pretty attractive for the majors. So I'm seeing plenty of evidence of consolidation in the, uh, in the sector. The next point, and I keep hammering this all the time, the importance of relative strength. US fund managers in particular cannot afford not to be in stocks and sectors that are outperforming the S&P. They just can't. And so it becomes a self-propelling situation. Sectors that are outperforming the S&P continue to draw support from the institutions. And finally, to wrap it all up, all of this is happening the free cash flow yields, the rocketing earnings, um, the attractiveness of takeovers and mergers, all of this is happening when we've got the most conducive environment for gold that we've seen in decades. And I won't go through all the factors. You, I think you've all got a pretty clear picture of what all those factors are. So that's where we stand in the precious metals market. Let's have a look at GDX and what it did for the week, so this is a weekly chart. You can see we've got a breakout on our hands. We had a retrace, bit of a retracement during the week, uh, but then a bounce off the lows, and, and precious metal stocks did really quite well on Friday night. So this looks to me like a breakout, a retest of the breakout, plenty of buying support coming in in this area here, and um, you know the, the trend is, is clearly up. And when you get a breakout from a base that, started forming in the middle of 2013, then it's highly likely that it's going to run quite a distance and for quite a few years. Seven year base, the breakout could easily run that long to the upside. And the last time that we had a, a major breakout in GDX, um, it, uh, it ran a long time. All right, turning to other commodities, copper firmed a little bit, few cents to 242. Crude oil also uh, firmed another dollar fifty or so. We're back to 35, but we're really in this zone of resistance now. Um, you know, energy stocks still struggling. Um, it's it's just not an area that um, that you really want to focus on at the moment. Yes, you might pick up. So this is a bit like the banks. You might pick up a uh, a short term rebound. It might be quite high in percentage terms but it's not high in probability and it can turn back down and fall on top of you very very quickly. There's the spot copper chart and wrapping it up I just think there's never before has there been such an important point where you need to reconsider all your assumptions. If, if your mindset is still that you look to just do the same old same old you buy the household names, you stick to conventional thinking, then I'd really encourage you to rethink it. Last week I talked about um, why the hunt for yield was so dangerous because it leads you into stocks that are um, mostly lagging and mostly have very, very strong headwinds for as far as the eye can see. So why the hunt for yield? Why not the hunt for total return, capital gain, plus maybe a bit of small yield or maybe no yield. But for me, the hunt for total return is just light years better than the hunt for yield. So please re-examine the assumptions and methodologies that you use in the market. Trying to pick turnarounds in declining stocks is just a low probability exercise. Portfolio analyst this week, I'm going to be looking at a, at a few trading opportunities, I'm going to be looking at lots of different things. But... Um, there's, you know, there's just no shortage of opportunities if you know where to look. That's it for this week. If you want to find out more, there's my website details and my email address if you want to contact me. I'll be back with you next Sunday. Cheers.